Hi, and welcome to this week's The Q Conversations with Wikibon. This is a regular program that we're going to be producing from our studio here in Silicon Valley, uh, in which we use current events either generated out of the Wikibon research stream or just things that happen in the Valley to get together and discuss some of the big things happening in changes in digital business today. I'm Peter Burris, and today I've got George Gilbert, who's an analyst with Wikibon, and we're going to spend some time talking today about some recent research that we just completed, which looks at big data in public cloud. Now, you would think that there's a natural affinity between big data and public cloud, George, because on the one hand, public cloud suggests that it's available always, available everywhere, and available to anything, and big data says data can come from anywhere at any time, in any form. And, and I, I would add two other things, which is part of what makes big data valuable is the ability to add context in terms of other big data sets and to process it at, at scale, which both of which are unique characteristics to public cloud. So, you, so there is a strong affinity between yes. the two, but for the first 10 years, most of the big data investment has been on premise. It's gone into Hadoop, Low, you know, on-premise storage, on-premise processing, on-premise Hadoop, and related tools. And I, I would say the, pr the, the pr primary reason for that is probably that when you move to the cloud, you have a fundamental shift in the management model to shared infrastructure. And that sort of upends everything when we moved from mainframe to client-server distributed systems. It was all dedicated infrastructure. So the shift back is difficult. So we've been doing a fair amount of research on this topic, and uh, for those of you who have been paying close attention to Wikibon research not too long ago, we came out with our aggregate big data forecast. And uh, it showed that the marketplace, which is not small for big data, is going from around 20 billion, 22 billion, and it's grow to, going to grow over the next 10 years to about 92 billion, so just, just south of $100 billion. Big numbers. Uh, the public cloud marketplace, meanwhile, is going to grow from somewhere in the vicinity of about $80 billion uh, in 2015 to an enormous $490 plus billion, almost $500 billion of spend. And then the question that we asked ourselves as we thought about some of the dynamics of the big data marketplace, specifically looking at the applications uh, that we've been looking at over the course of the past few months, George, was, well, what percentage of big data spend is going to end up in the public cloud? And to kind of get right straight to it, today it's a relatively small percent. By 2026, we think it's going to be about 25% of big data spending will be in the public cloud, which is a not inconsequential amount of money. Uh, but it's not kind of the dominant you know, it's not it's not this dominant uh, everything else goes away kind of spending. Why is that, George? What do you think? Well, as we were, as we were going back and forth on the sort of underlying assumptions, I think the um, it's not just the raw infrastructure management. You know, how do we manage sort of sh shared access to hardware? Um, but we have to get uh, we have to solve some thorny problems in. Um, data protection. In other words, when you're, you're using data from different sources, um, s some of that has to be uh, sort of secured in motion, you know, when it's on the wire, when it's at rest, it has to be sort of cordoned off so that if it's, if some, a company, let's say like Salesforce, um, is running a multi-tenant application, they actually have to carve off um, N not the application so much as the parts of the data that belong to different customers, and that's a new skill still. Well, it's a, it's a highly complex job to segment data in that way. Yeah. See, the other reasons are, of course, that uh, big data, going back to some of the remarks you made in the introduction, big data presumes that you don't necessarily know where the source is or what source is going to be most valuable or where it is, or what other, as you mentioned, security, other kind of constraints it's under. And the simple reality is that there are two physical constraints that still dominate architecture today. One is, it costs something to maintain uh, the state of data. Now, we don't have quite as many problems with that in big data, because it's a very write-once-read-intensive kind of environment. 
But the second one, which is not going to go away anytime soon, so long as the law of physics are in place, is that it costs something to move data. You can't move data faster than the speed of light, and there are restrictions on how much data you can move at any given instant. Right. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about getting up to hundreds of megabits, uh, even gigabits of data uh, on a lot of different uh, networks around uh, that are available to, to uh, corporations of all sizes. But the simple reality is that we are generating data at multiple gigabytes a second in sometimes simple systems. So take that a step further. Are we originating that data in the cloud or, or in systems that are more easily connected to public clouds, or is that data coming into you know, enterprise infrastructure um, and enterprise applications and then having to be sort of commingled for context in the public cloud? And that's one of the great questions about the types of applications that are going to be, that are on the horizon that will exploit big data. So for example, today when we're looking at ad tech or web analytics or something like that, still these systems are generating enormous amounts of data, but they tend to generate it in the cloud or pretty close to the cloud. So that an individual that is acquiring some resource from a business is probably doing so by connecting to some mechanism up in the cloud and then doing a bunch of work and that data is in the cloud and it's easier to keep it in the cloud. But when we start talking about Internet of Things, for example, or applications that are, uh, well, we'll just use Internet of, Th Internet of Things, um, then those that data may be generated hundreds or thousands of miles away from a particular cloud-based resource. And then the question is, are we going to stream all that data out of that video camera sitting at the corner of Park in Maine, overlooking the front of the bank that's tracking who's going in, who's going out, what the demographics of the individuals are, or for security reasons, are we going to stream that back 2,000 miles to Los Angeles somewhere so that it can actually be stored and processed and, and hit using some sort of big data analytics? That's what we're not sure about at this point in time. Maybe there's an analogy that we can use from the, the emerging architecture of online video games where the low latency um, sort of immediate processing has to happen locally on your, on your console or on your PC or, or even on your mobile device. But when you want to render the big environment, sort of optimize the whole ecosystem, that happens on the cloud, and there's low latency enough to tell the the local device how to how to render the new environment. And so, tying this back to Internet of Things, the um, low latency, quick response, make a decision about how to update or or control a device, happens locally, but some data goes back into the cloud to optimize how the ecosystem performs over time. And so I think there might be some complementarity, but we don't have the software architecture, or for that matter, the hardware infrastructure in place to do that. And I think it's a great, I think it's a great example, George, and you know, at Wikibon, we think that's exactly how it's going to play out, is the idea that, for example, the broad rules about customer experience yeah. and the broad rules about fraud and the broad rules governing cybersecurity and those types of things, pricing, will be things that are back in the cloud that have ecosystem elements associated yes. with them, but how the actual behavior or the actual action that takes place proximate to the customer once price is, in st once price is there, once uh, general rules of customer experience, who the customer is, has all been present and made stateful locally, then those decisions can be handled locally without having an enormous amount of data being shipped back and forth. So the key question is, when we look at those local applications and the sort of centralized or cloud-based um, scenarios, if we had to weigh them in terms of data volumes, what would you, is it possible to, to sort of do a global estimate or is it really use case specific at this point? You know, George, I think that's, uh, I'm not sure about, I don't think we really know, uh, but here's a, here's a, I, there's a, a law of automation, law of automation, a uh, rule of thumb of automation that actually I developed probably 20 years ago, that seems to be playing out pretty well. And that is, with every successive generation of automation, the number of transactions required to support that automation increases sevenfold. Huh. And so, and that, that might actually be going up. But the point is, is that as we try to automate behavior 
locally, the chances are is that the amount of data and the number of transactions to do that is going to go up sevenfold relative to what we would do if we were to try to automate it back at the cloud. Now, think about this. So let's just use banking as an, as an example. Uh, if uh, in the old days when you did branch banking, you'd go into the branch, let's just pick some numbers, once a week. And then when you do ATM, well, you typically, or ATM or, uh, or online, you do it seven times more frequently. Mm -hmm. You'd touch your accounts, you'd, in some way, the bank would touch your accounts, you'd touch your accounts, and you can just kind of see how it explodes over time. So an activity that used to be relatively simple and happened once every two weeks, say, with, you know, deposit a check, withdraw money, now is taking place through a lot of these big debit card systems, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times every couple of weeks. As we push more of the responsibility for governing how those behaviors actually get affected closer to these local IoT systems, utilizing more data because, you know, we're going to have to validate faces. We're talking about transactions that are not, you know, 100 kilobytes in size, but are multiple megabytes in size when we start using biometric kinds of uh, security, then we're talking about uh, a lot more data. So I think that what we'll be doing over time is using that network speed as a reasonable constraint on thinking about how those architectures are going to get set up. But we can, what we can be certain about is that as we do more automation, we're going to be putting at least linearly more work on these systems, and perhaps it'll be even increasing over time. When you say put linearly or, or, or more work, are you talking about the edge side or the cloud side? Talking about the, the overall, overall aggregate system side, okay. which is why there's going to be an increasing pressure to do more work at the edge. Okay. So we'll see how it plays out, because no doubt new types of compression, algorithms will, will be available, uh, will come up with uh, uh, ways of pre-processing a lot of the different media that we might utilize to try to distill the signal out of the noise uh, so that we can move data more effectively and efficiently back and forth. But it's fair to say that, again, as we automate more, we're going to use more data, requiring more transactions, and that will provide a reasonable governor on where we actually do the work. So if we, it, our forecast looks out 10 years, and there are a lot of uh, assumptions and milestones in that sort of forecast. What are some of those assumptions and milestones that we might revisit each year, you know, or every couple years to see were we right in, in our assessments? Well, I think the big ones, George, and you've talked about this in your research, and so in many respects I should be turning it over to you, but I think the big one is pretty clear. We expect that there will be a few milestones in the development of the big data marketplace that are tied back to the rate at which application packaging technologies evolve and improve. So we talked about, for example, we talked about this last week, we talked about, for example, the evolution of data lake technology and how fast data lake technology is going to evolve, both as a technology into itself, as a way of perhaps offloading more complex what is today called data warehousing work, even data prep and data movement, you know, the whole ETL marketplace as it gets affected by what we can do with Data Lake. But we also expect that increasingly we're going to see these intelligent systems of engagement start to evolve where engagement decisions are made more by the system itself, taking a look at pricing, taking a look at the types of offers, making recommendations, et cetera. And then the last one is this notion of self-tuning systems of intelligence, which really comes back to how the applications themselves take more responsibility for formulating and refining the models that we use to actually lay out the system of options that we present to customers. All right, now let me take you back along that same, um, that same sort of step, set of step functions in the, the applications and take it from a different angle, which is how would you carve up, because this isn't something I've really addressed in, in that sort of research sort of tech, taxonomy. Certainly not stuff we've published yet. Yeah, but how would you carve up between what belongs, since we're, we're moving from, you know, the, the era of centralization with, you know, semi-rich clients, but really end devices. Now we want to go back to where we have some sort of beefy processing, you know, closer to the edge. How would you divide up the capabilities of those applications between Whereas now, you know, it's 
smart device, big cloud, and where we now have, we, we will soon have, you know, gateways and edge processing. Is there, do we have patterns that we can look at? Well, I think right now the pattern is, most obvious pattern is that the edge, as you said, the edge devices are getting a lot more potent. Uh, they're getting more potent both in terms of their processing power, uh, their memory capacities. Uh, you, we get very, very large physical memories in some of these devices, uh, and we're only going to get more. Um, the data capture technologies that they have, for example, having uh, very, very high quality cameras in all these devices, generates greater pressure to put software that's able to take advantage of those uh, those cameras. Uh, and we're seeing, for instance, in the smartphone industry, uh, a lot of new competition about being able to do local video capture, local video editing, present things, and then upload things any way you want. My guess is that what we're going to see happen over time is a lot of that will be uh, presented as automated services that are available to applications. So a lot of things that we're doing on phones today, for example, will be rendered on phones as services that applications can exploit for certain qualities of what we might call edge behaviors. The same thing is going to happen when we start talking about sensors that are gathering enormous amount of information and then having a control element of feedback loop capability that can do increasingly complex types of processing to then affect some sort of behavior on a physical device somewhere through a control type of relationship. Okay, so that's the part I want to push you on because it sounds like that's another tier, you know, between the mobile device and the cloud. You know, are we going to see one tier, two tiers, and what functions might beyond those, if, if it's visible or, or discernible at all? You know, uh, there's a, there has historically been made, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of attention has been paid to different tiers and different platforms. And while I think that's important, I think that in all honesty, George, I think the data is going to decide. I think the data is going to decide and the speed of the network, and very importantly, some of the emerging uh, approaches to conceptualizing and building these new applications. Um, for example, there are uh, reasons to suspect that the kind of middleware-oriented, library-rich approaches to doing application development are going to have to be uh, replaced by some set of technologies that allow the network to do uh, even more of the decision-making about where a device is, how to format data for the, the device, present it to the device, the device. The same basic things that we do in computer science are going to have to be done, but more than likely the network's going to take over more of that. I, look, we're, we're going to have, we know we're going to have big databases. We know we're going to have server farms somewhere that are processing those big databases. We know there's going to be a network. We know there's going to be varying stages of of, uh, of, of control points throughout the network to handle formatting, to handle control, to handle synchronization and state. Uh, things that look like super context data, you know, uh, uh, content data networks uh, that just do a lot more processing. And we also know we're going to have increasingly rich devices. So as an arc, from an architecture standpoint, the thing that we need to look at is look at the nature of the problem, understand what work is trying to be done, who's going to participate in that work, and what capabilities we need to build so that we can do it better than anybody else, and then take a look at the availability of the technology from an infrastructure standpoint, from a data management standpoint, and from a development standpoint, and ultimately management and automation standpoint, and that's going to be a moving target for the next few years. Do you agree with that? Um, yeah, meaning it's all in flux and that platforms we need a new platform for these self-tuning systems of intelligence or IOT, and it's not 100% clear what it's going to be, but there are, you know, the future never shows up all at once. We see a couple precursors where GE's predicts platform. Um, you know, it's not just PaaS for um, industrial objects um, or ecosystems of them, but uh, it's it creates something where in the old web generation we had content distribution networks where you could serve up web pages close to where they're being consumed. Here they create these digital twins so that they can monitor and optimize the behavior of each individual industrial device. Then IBM told us that they didn't buy the weather company so that they could inject better weather forecasting into you know industrial activities like 
oil and gas exploration. They bought it because they wanted that same, um, they wanted that same uh, uh, capability or similar ca capability to what GE is doing in terms of a very distributed processing and data collection infrastructure. And um, I guess one big question is, will new companies like GE and, and IBM define that next tier of platform, you know, for intelligent Internet of Things apps, or would we, will we continue to see, you know, uh, Amazon and Microsoft and, and Google spread their footprints out? So, no, I think we need to make, we've got to wrap up after this. Uh, so here's what I'd say, George, it's going to be all of the above. Uh, but what we do know is that whatever happens, physics is not going to change. Computer science will have to evolve and vendors will take advantage of the gaps to introduce new technologies, and ultimately users will decide what to adopt, when to adopt, how to adopt it, and will dictate through their activities the shape that the market takes place over the next 20 years. But it's going to be a really, really interesting place to be. Certainly one of the most important things happening right now. So with that, George Gilbert, thank you very much. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, like to thank everybody uh, for joining us for another CUBE conversation. We intend to do this on a regular basis, as I said, uh, hopefully weekly. Uh, my name is Peter Burris, Wikibon, SiliconANGLE Media, George Gilbert, Wikibon, thanks very much for watching. Thank <laughs> you.